reminder, you know, Hope and Passion Ministries depends on your giving. Uh, we need donors. We need people who will give to us monthly. We need people who will uh, donate to us when they're able. So we are praying that you will pray and ask the Lord to give to hopeandpassion.org, to our physical mailing address. But I can do this full time because God is providing donors. So please pray about that. I urge you always, if you are being fed, if you know that Jesus is feeding you spiritually through this ministry, then really it behooves you to pray about giving back so that we can continue to feed people. And I want to tell you, you know, I posted a TikTok late this afternoon. It was called, What Does Evolution Have to Do with Antichrist? And that TikTok, right before we went on air, was going viral. It had hit 5,000 views, and it was going up about 1,000 views every 10 minutes. So I have a feeling it's going to go pretty big. And one of the first young ladies that got on and saw that video, it was so precious to me. She lives in Malta, all right, in the Mediterranean Sea, a little island, Malta, in the Mediterranean Sea. And she got on TikTok, and she asked me if I would please come and preach the gospel to her church because her pastor is tired and weary. I'm telling you what, it is incredible the things that are happening through Hope and Passion Ministries, but it can only happen as you continue to support us. So thank you so much for your faithful giving. As you can tell, uh, we work hard here at Hope and Passion. We work hard. I study and pray and seek the Lord. And this is just my joy and my pleasure to do. Okay, Genesis. I want you to open your Bibles, if you have them, to Genesis. We're going to begin at the last, uh, well, let's see, at verse 30 of chapter 11 and sail right into 12. So chapter 11, verse 30, let me read for continuity's sake just a few verses here, and then we'll pray and dig in. Here's where we're at. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What a study. We're on the precipice of some amazing stuff here for you to know. You need to know the Bible's big picture as well as its details. So Holy Spirit, we come before you this evening and we're calling on you because nothing, nothing that matters comes from us. It all comes from you, dear Lord. God, we ask you to cleanse our hearts, to prepare our minds. We ask you to come against the powers of darkness who would seek to distract us, dissuade us, deter us from hearing what you want us to hear. I'm praying for the power of the Holy Spirit to move mightily tonight. You have been moving so mightily and have been so faithful and we count on you once again. Lord, I feel like the scripture says we are in a, a, a dry and thirsty land and we desire to drink your living water. So pour it out to us this evening we ask. I pray over our nation, dear Lord. We're on the precipice of the inauguration of the new president of the United States, and we pray over our nation. We know that you are sovereign. And we ask, dear Lord, that you move forward 
We ask, Lord, that you give us strength and wisdom. We pray, Lord, for leadership from top to bottom. That people who don't know you as Savior would be saved. And Lord, that your perfect will would be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, here we go. So, we're talking about Abraham. A lot of us know him as Father Abraham. The Bible says in Genesis 11.30 that his wife Sarai was barren and she had no child. Now, you just heard me read at the beginning of chapter 12 that God made a promise to Abraham that through him every nation of the earth would be blessed. We know that the promise of God to Abraham was that he would have children as vast as the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. And yet the Bible says Sarai was barren. She was infertile. She had no child. And as I was sitting reading that the other day, I, I put this down in my notes. This direct statement of Sarai's circumstance is critical. When we come to understand the promise that God is going to make to Abraham, God always knows what he is doing. Even when it seems impossible to us, that he is working for our good and for the big picture of his plan. Amen? You have any situations in your life where you look at the situation and you say, what in the world is God doing? I think that's a question that we ask as soon as we read this verse. You know, we're, we're, we work backwards to this verse knowing who Abraham is and who he has become and the promise of God to him. But, you know, when God was making that promise to him, he had a wife that couldn't have children. And I thought to myself the other day, why in the world would God call a man who is old and has a barren wife, why in the world would God call that man to be the father of the Jewish nation and the progenitor of Jesus Christ? Why would he call him to be the one who was going to be the father of descendants as vast as the sand on the seashore? And I propose to you he did it because God loves, he delights to do the impossible. Amen? He delights to take the weak and the powerless and, and where it looks like there is no chance and make something happen. Hallelujah. John Calvin said this, not only does Moses say that Abram had no children, but he states the reason, namely the sterility of his wife. Moses does this to show that it was nothing short of an extraordinary miracle that she later bore Isaac. Thus was God pleased to humble his servant. We cannot doubt that Abram suffered severe pain through this privation. I want you to think about that. This was a time when the inability to have children really brought a stigma upon a family, upon a man. And I am sure that Abram did suffer under this. I mean, there are times, I know there are times you just, there are times that I, you know, go before God and I cry and I moan before him. God, why? As we suffer under circumstances that we cannot quite understand. I think John Calvin hits it here. He said, Abram saw the wicked springing up everywhere in great numbers to cover the earth. And he alone was deprived of children, or so he thought. You know, Abram has this call of God in his life, and he's looking at these idolaters and these wicked people everywhere, and he doesn't even have kids. Although he still did not know about his future vocation, God designed to make it evident in his person from what and in what way his church should arise. For at that time it lay hidden, as in a dry root under the earth. You see, Abram watched the wicked rise up, had no children of his own. It took the miracle working hand of God to bring forth the Jewish nation from Abraham and Sarah. And what John Calvin is alluding to here is Abraham is the father of our faith. And it is the same with us. We cannot save ourselves. Christians 
don't pull themselves up by the bootstraps and make themselves saved. It takes the miracle working hand of God to reach down and to save a person. In Romans 4.16, and I'm going to refer to the New Living Translation here because I love the way that this is rendered, makes it so understandable. Listen to Scripture interpret Scripture. In the book of Romans, here's what Paul said. The promise is received by faith. My goodness, in Abraham's case, it had to be by faith. Sarah was barren. God promises Abram he'll be the father of a nation. He had to believe by faith. It is given as a free gift. And we are all certain to receive it whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. Okay? That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of absolutely nothing. I love this scripture. It's pointing way back to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What substance did God have to build from? And the answer is nothing. God is the only one who can create something out of nothing and bring the dead back to life. He brought Sarah's dead womb back to life. Amen? He can take a, a sinner who is dead in their sin. The Bible says in Romans 3, we don't even seek after God. No one even reaches out after God. We are dead in our sins. You know, a sick person might be able to help themselves, but a dead person, they can't do a thing for themselves. But God can bring the dead back to life. And this beautiful picture of Abraham and Sarah shows us the way salvation works. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping believing that he would become the father of many nations, for God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. Amen? Look at this. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. You looking into the camera tonight at me might not have any reason to hope in any given situation, but you keep on hoping. Because you're serving a God that can make something out of nothing. Verse 19, and Abraham's faith did not weaken. Even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. I know they had a longer lifespan back then. But I just want you to imagine a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman who has been barren up to this point having a child. You know, or, or expecting to have this child. It, it's unbelievable. But that's the way God works. So in verse 31, here's what we hear next. So Sarai was barren. Terah, now remember, Terah is a descendant of Shem. Shem is a son of Noah. Okay, so Abraham comes from Shem's line who came from Noah. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, okay, so Terah had had sons. He had Abram, and he had Haran also. Haran had died. Lot was his son. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Now, I know this is confusing because Haran here is a referral here to a person, okay, one of Terah's sons, and here Haran is the name of a city, which we do believe that that city was probably named after Haran, who might have been uh, the founder or a key person in that city. But here's what I want you to remember before I even go anywhere else. Remember Ur of the Chaldeans? Remember last session? Ur of the Chaldeans, which I'll show you in a minute on a map, as part of Mesopotamia, was the center of pagan idolatry. And we left off on a great note last week in understanding that the father of our faith was once an idolater. He was called out of that. So, 
Terah took Abram, and they went forth from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. They knew that Canaan was their destination. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Now, this is very, very important. Everyone should have that verse underlined in your Bible. This is critically important. They knew that they were to go where? To Canaan, from Ur to Canaan. And as you're going to see in a minute, that would have been a direct shot west. But they went north, northwest, and they came to a city called Haran and settled there. So let's talk about that for a minute. Here's a map that will show you clearly these places that I'm speaking of. Now this is Ur of the Chaldeans. You can see the Persian Gulf here. This is all in the Middle East. Here's the Mediterranean Sea, all right? So they came from Ur of the Chaldeans, a center of idolatry, and God had called Abram to the Canaan land. As you can see, Canaan would be west. This is the city of Haran. The Bible says that they traveled to Haran and they settled there. Again, this is the Euphrates River and the Tigris River, all a critical area to what even is going on in the world today. Now, we're going to cross-reference. We're going to let Scripture interpret Scripture. I'm going to go to the book of Acts where it speaks of Abram. you got Abram in Romans, you got Abram in uh, Hebrews, and we got him in Acts here. So here we go. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Again, Mesopotamia is where Ur was before he lived in Haran. Okay, so see what Luke is saying in Acts? God appeared to Abraham while he was still in Ur of the Chaldeans before he ever lived in Haran and said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. And of course we know that that land that God was going to give to Abraham and show him was the Canaan land. So then Abram went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land. Okay, Luke is speaking of Israel, the Canaan land, into this land in which you're now living. He's giving a history lesson here. Yet God gave Abram no inheritance in it not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. Now that's a mouthful, but that's a really neat cross-reference. Do you see that? I love where we allow the Bible to interpret itself. So we get another picture here from Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, telling us the history. Abram was called to Canaan. He did go to Haran. And God didn't actually give the land to Abram, but promised it to his descendants. So let's go back to Genesis then in the Old Testament and look at this. This is a huge point. When they, who is they? Abram's father, Terah. Abram, his wife, Sarai. His nephew, Lot. All right? When they all came to Haran... They settled there. But God's call was not for them to go to Haran, was it? God's call was for them to go to the Canaan land. Let's talk about this. John Phillips, the commentator, said this. The immediate narrative in Genesis there does not record how or when the true and living God revealed himself to Abram the pagan idolater of Ur. But evidently he did appear to him because in response to that revelation, not only Abram, but also Terah, his father, Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, all took the first step. So I agree with John Phillips here. We don't know the exact details or the exact timeline but God obviously appeared to Abram in a major way because whatever he said to Abram prompted the going forth of Abram's father, his wife, and his nephew. All right, Warren Wearsby, a more recent pastor and Bible commentator, said this, It appears that Terah did believe, the father of Abram, right? It appears that Terah did believe and took charge of the family in their travels. 
But Terah was the man who stopped. Hear that? Terah was the man who stopped. He traveled 500 miles as far as the city of Haran, and there he settled down, and there he died. Perhaps the journey was too great for him. But it was God's plan that Abraham and Sarah follow him without their family. Now, we don't want to be too hard on Terah because we don't know. We can't read too much into the circumstances, but here's what we do know. God called Abram to Canaan. For some reason, his father going with him, they ended up in Haran. They stayed there and they settled there for a while. And actually, Terah ended up dying there and never made it to the Canaan land. John Calvin says this, It appears that Terah was not so far deluded by superstitions as to be destitute of the fear of God. It was difficult for the old man, failing in health, to tear himself away from his own country, Ur of the Chaldeans, but some true religion, although smothered, remained in his mind. Have you ever known people like that? They have a sense that there's a God who exists, right? They may give him a little bit of reverence or try to act a little bit morally because they do believe in a God, but the whole thing's kind of clouded over. And we kind of get that feeling about the father of Abraham, Terah. We don't know exactly what happened, but he only went part way. John Calvin goes on to say, Therefore, when he knew that the place from which his son was commanded to depart was accursed, in other words, when Abraham went to his dad and said, Hey, Dad, God you know, appeared to me, God told me, we got to get out of here. We're called to a different way of life. We're called to somewhere else. We're not to stay here. This place is wrong. It's cursed. It's idolatrous. Well, Terah bought into that. Even look at his son and say, you're a nutcase. Go by yourself, right? He decided to go with him. It was Terah's wish not to perish there in Ur. So he joined himself as an associate with Abram, whom the Lord was about to deliver. What a witness, I demand, will he prove in the last day to condemn our own indolence, all right? We have such an apathy, but when God strikes it up with someone like Abram, Lord, let us be so on fire for your calling that others would want to try it out and maybe go along. Henry Morris, Dr. Henry Morris said this, this passage suggests that Terah himself may have received some kind of command from the Lord to go to the land of Canaan too. If so, he only obeyed in part, right? Remember, Terah was the man who stopped. He only went part way. He left Ur all right, but instead of striking directly westward across the desert to Canaan, he moved northwest up the Mesopotamian Valley, finally reaching Haran. So again, here is our map. And uh, give me a thumbs up out there if you agree that seeing the geography helps you understand the bigger picture, right? This is all important. So as we look at this, here's what we're saying. When God called Abram to Canaan, they could have gone directly westward. We don't know why. They end up going northwest. You know, it would have almost been a shorter distance or at least the same distance to go straight across. But instead, they end up in Haran. Now, here's a modern day map. And this is Turkey, as you can see. Here's Syria. This is where modern day Haran is. Okay? Again, a lot of what we're seeing as, you, as we're studying a Revelation, you're seeing that the, the uh, seven churches that John wrote to are located in modern-day Turkey. And so, too, was Haran, where Terah ended up dying on the way to Canaan. Now, let's make a few points, okay? I put a few points in my notes. I want you to think about something. Haran was probably the settlement established by Terah's son, Haran. It's a little confusing because he has a son named Haran, there's a city named Haran. So Bible scholars believe that was probably the settlement or the place that Terah's son established. But remember that Haran, his son, had died. Okay? 
Now, the city of Haran was about the same distance northwest as Canaan was due west, as I already pointed out. We saw that on the map. Number three, maybe Terah needed to go to Haran to settle his son's affairs. Some Bible scholars believe that, and that could very well be true. You know, when God knew that Abram was being called a different direction, maybe Terah said, you know, I've got some business to business to take care of with my son's estate and so I'm going to go along and let's stop there let's make a pit stop right to take care of things there John Phillips again Herring was a frontier town of the Babylonian Empire and like Ur of the Chaldees was devoted to the worship of the moon god so Herring was another idolatrous city there, the whole pilgrimage bogged down. And it would seem remained inert and inactive for about 25 years until Terah died. Now think about that. God had a calling on Abram's life, and the whole thing got bogged down by some decision. And then there was no movement and there was no motion is very important for us to understand that when God calls us, we need to go. Amen? We cannot be deterred. We're going to get to that in just a few minutes. After all, the old nature as represented by Terah, hey, the new man is represented by Abram, the old nature represented by his father can make only token responses to divine things. You know, people who aren't truly saved... People who aren't truly born again, they can make responses, but they're just a token. They're not truly from a new spirit or a new heart. Abram greatly erred in not fully obeying God and in allowing the world and the flesh to insert themselves between him and the divine call. But God is patient. Can I get an amen? God is patient. Abram was very young in the faith. He had a lot to learn. And after all, God could afford to wait. Who's thankful that even if Abram got bogged down for 25 years in Haran, God did not remove his call from Abram. Amen? And God was still going to do what he was going to do. Now, another point I want to make for you. Haran was on an important trade route coming up from Canaan and Syria, and it had become a very important city. On the way, now watch this, because when I was studying this geography, a thought hit me. Watch this. On the way from Ur to Haran, the family would have passed near or through the great city of Babylon and would have been reminded of the terrible judgment of just two centuries previous. Now, I want you to think about this. It would have been about 200 years since the Tower of Babel and the dispersion of nations and the confusion of languages. Only 200 short years. And when people's lives, lifespans were so long, that wasn't a very long time, was it? So I want you to think about this. Abram and Terah and Lot and Sarah, they're traveling up northwest to Haran, and they had to go directly through the ruins of Babylon. Imagine that. And they had to see and be reminded of the dispersion of nations and the severe judgment against that antichrist rebellious kingdom under Nimrod. That got me to thinking. And I have a map here to show you something. It really got me to thinking. So I, I kind of made these, uh, these shapes bigger than they really are so that you would be able to see them. But if this yellow dot here represents Ur, which is just about where Ur was, Abram was called to go from Ur over here to the Canaan land. Now the Bible calls this land the promised land. Amen? Israel. The promised land, the Canaan land. He was to go from here to here. And I have the star directly on where Jerusalem would be. How many of you are praying for the peace of Jerusalem? How many of you know 
Jerusalem is God's city, no matter what man says. So Abram was called to go from there to there. But instead, he goes to Haran and makes a stop. And along the way, as you can see, they would have had to pass Babylon. They would have remembered from the great oral traditions of the day, they would have remembered, they would have looked at that, and they would have known and been reminded of what an antichrist spirit, a rebellion against God, will do. In my notes, as I was looking at this map, I was thinking to myself, isn't that interesting? I'm going to show you what I thought in just a moment. In a final sense, all of history for the Christian is moving in the same direction as Abraham did. We are aiming for the Canaan land and the new Jerusalem. Hallelujah. How many of you out there are aiming for the new Jerusalem? Now, I, I, some of you may be new to these broadcasts, and you may not hear me talk about this all the time, but I just want everyone to know, before I go any further, I want you to understand something. When a saved person dies right now, their spirit goes into the presence of the Lord. Their body stays in the grave. When Jesus comes back the second time, okay, when he comes back the second time, at the rapture, the believer's body will come out of the ground and be made new to meet their spirit in the air. When Jesus comes back the second time after the tribulation, he is going to bring the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the presence of God down to this remade earth. Second Peter chapter 3 says, the heavens and the earth that exists now will be remade by fire into a brand new home of righteousness. And then Revelation 21 tells us that God will bring his presence wherever God's throne is right now with Jesus seated beside him. That throne and his presence will come down to this earth in the new Jerusalem. Hallelujah. So, you know, you've got the millennial reign of Jesus before all that happens, a thousand-year reign of Christ before he remakes the earth. But Jesus will come back, and he will rule and reign on this earth from Jerusalem. The Bible's very specific. And then when the new heaven and new earth are created, he will bring a heavenly Jerusalem down. So he'll rule from the Jerusalem on this earth for a thousand years. Then he'll bring the new Jerusalem out of heaven down here. I want you to understand all that because we have a grand hope. But there is no Christian that should not that should not be paying attention to Jerusalem and what's going on in the Middle East because God is moving and Jesus will rule from there one day. But my ultimate hope as a Christian is to travel from where I am today lost in this broken, sin-cursed world to the new Jerusalem, hallelujah, on the new heavens and the new earth. That's our destiny. So again, in a final sense, all of history for the Christian is moving in the same direction as Abraham did. We're aiming for the Canaan land and the new Jerusalem. The Bible often refers to the Canaan land as the promised land. And as you read in the New Testament, um, the, the Bible refers to that heavenly Jerusalem, the promised land that we will all be in, okay? Now, in order to arrive there, though, humanity must pass through the time of the Antichrist. Now, notice I didn't say Christians, but humanity has to pass through the time of the Antichrist, and we will be blessed to witness the awful judgment of sin in the final sense. Then we, have, we shall have truly arrived home. So I want you to think about that for a minute. Abram had to travel to get to that promised land. And you and I have got some traveling to do to get to the new Jerusalem. We got to make it through this life. We got to make it through this world. And history as a whole has got to pass through. 
The tribulation period, the time of God's judgment and the time of the Antichrist. And I say this all the time. We get way too downtrodden and disheartened when we see things what appear to be falling apart in our opinion. But really things are falling into place from God's perspective. Amen? Listen. The time of the Antichrist has to come in order for us to get to the New Jerusalem. Now, we'll be up there with Jesus for seven years while the, while the tribulation proper takes place. But the history must move through this. And it's got to happen sometime, right? It's like I always say, you know, the Bible is full of the warning that there will be false teachers and false preachers in the end times. And if the Bible says there's going to be false teachers everywhere, then they've got to be somewhere. Maybe they're right around where we are. Amen? And if we've got to pass through the time of the Antichrist, hey, then at some point it's going to happen. And we know, according to what's happening in the world today, that everything is being set into place for this one world ruler. But I want to show you on the map what I mean, okay? So you can think about this in picture form. Ur of the Chaldeans, that's where Abram was called out of idolatry. He's the father of our faith. We as Christians are called out of sin, right? We start off here in our sinful state, and then all of a sudden Jesus gets a hold of us and saves us and says, i got a plan for you. And by the way, my plan is for you to get to the promised land. And I think there are some Christians out there who have forgotten that that is God's plan. Amen? I wrote a post today on Facebook, and it got a lot of likes, you know, but I was trying to shake people up. I said, dear Christian, have you forgotten that this world is not your final destination? Have you forgotten that you're headed out of here and that heaven is ahead? So this is us. We get called, we get saved, and we're headed for the new Jerusalem. But you know what? The world as a whole has got to first. You know, Abram and his family had to pass by the ruins of Babylon. They had to remember the severe judgment of God. And the Tower of Babel was the first foreshadowing of the Antichrist in the Bible. And we, as humanity, history, will have to move through that time of tribulation, that time of God pouring out not his first judgment, but his final judgment on the world during the time of the Antichrist reign and the seven-year tribulation. And then, hallelujah, once we get past that, Jesus is going to come back. And he is going to be riding a white horse. And he is going to fight the battle of Armageddon. Amen? And I believe we'll be with him, riding back with him to this earth to fight the battle of Armageddon. And then, finally, as I alluded to earlier, we get closer and we get closer to the heavenly Jerusalem. When Jesus comes back, he is going to cast Satan into an abyss, the bottomless pit, for a thousand years. He's going to be bound in a bottomless pit. While we Christians rule and reign on this earth. Can you imagine? On this earth. I think it was Taya the other day. I forget what our conversation was. But um, she was. We were, we were studying the Bible. And she said something about uh, Jesus being president. And I said, Jesus is going to be president. Right? He's going to be president for a thousand years on this actual earth. Can't wait for that day. The millennial reign. And finally, my friends, after the millennial reign, when, G when, when and Satan is loosed and tries to give his one last fit of rebellion, he is taken down by Jesus swiftly and quickly and cast into the lake of fire and Jesus makes the new heaven and the new earth. And instead of reigning from the earthly Jerusalem, God brings down the heavenly Jerusalem and plants it right here on the face of this earth. Who's excited for that? And then we finally reach our destination. So when you think about the travels of Abraham and what went through his mind as he walked past the ruins of the Tower of Babel. I want you to remember that the God of history is the God of the future. 
And this is going somewhere. Amen? And the humanity, history must pass through these times. But my friend, we will get there. We will get to the promise. Hallelujah. All right, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. That's a pretty big command. Notice what God said. This is your country. This is your people, your kin. These are your relatives, your immediate family. And I want you to go from there to another land. You know, making a decision to follow Jesus is not a lighthearted thing. Actually, as we're going to see here, when God calls you to salvation, he calls you to leave your own life and give it up for him. And that's pretty much what he was telling Abram to do. I wrote in my notes, what a command and what a risk if we only look at it from a human standpoint. If you don't consider that there's a divine and loving God behind this whole thing, that's a pretty risky thing to do. But knowing that the God of the universe called you to do it, there's no risk at all. This is going to be all a wonderful gain for you if you will take God at his word. In Hebrews 11, 8, again, we're going to let another book of the Bible corroborate the truth of Abraham. In verse 8 of Hebrews 11, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, look at this, not knowing where he was going. I, you know, I've done that at times in my life. When God says it's time to make a move, it's time to do this or that, and you're like, but God, wh wh what am I doing? Where am I going? How is this going to work out? And you pray and you seek the face of the Lord and he tells you to do something, you do it. Because you may not know where you're going, but you know the God who's taking you there. Amen? You don't need to know where you're going all the time. I know I'm a type A personality in case you didn't realize that. And I like to have my ducks in a row and I like to plan things out. But God says, look, I'm not looking for you to know where you're going. I'm looking for you to put your hand in my hand and I'll take you to where you're supposed to go. By faith, he went to live in a land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents. With Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise, living in tents. That's key. Because Abram did not have a permanent dwelling place here. He was a pilgrim. Are your wheels spinning? We are just pilgrims. This is not our permanent home. We're just passing through. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God himself. Amen? Listen, you and I are not really headed to any earthly place. we got to remember that we're headed to a real and tangible new Jerusalem. You have inheritance, my friend. You have a home. And we never really feel comfortable in this world as Christians. Because we're not there yet. But we're going to be. We're going to be. I promise you that. Now, chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your kindred, your father's house to the land that I will show you. I put in my notes, we know that the call of Abram came while he was still in Ur. Now, we already looked at this scripture previously, but it doesn't hurt to review. Remember what the Bible says here. Abram was called while he was still in Ur. In Acts chapter 7, we get to read about Abraham. And uh, let me go, yes, let me go to verse 2. Stephen, before he was martyred and stoned for being a Christian, stood up and said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. And said, go out. Okay, so Stephen quotes Genesis 12, 1. The Lord said this to Abram, who later became Abraham. And we'll get to that soon. But 
I want to talk about Abraham for just a minute. Because God called one particular man. Now this is very interesting. Abraham is not just the father of our faith. He's not just an important person in the faith of a Christian. Abraham is very important to three major religions. Now, I only call Christianity a religion because we're talking about religions. Christianity is much more than a religion. Okay? It is relationship with the living God of the universe. But as far as things go, there are three religions that trace their heritage through Abraham. Christianity, of course, we see Abraham as the father of our faith. For Christians, we don't look to Abraham as some supernatural being. Only Jesus is that, amen? We know that Genesis 15, 6 says this. Genesis 15, 6. Abram believed the Lord, and God credited it to him as righteousness. In other words, we don't believe that Abraham was better than any other human being. He was a pagan idolater. He was a sinner just like us. But when God came down to him, when God said, this is what I'm going to do, do you know what Abram said? I believe. That's all he said. He said, I believe. And Genesis 15, 6, so beautifully, every Christian should memorize that verse, says, Abram believed the Lord. And God credited that to him as righteousness. In that moment, by just, not by Abraham being good or suddenly becoming a good person, but by him looking up to God and saying, I take you at your word, I believe, God looked down and said, Abram, you are now righteous. You are now perfect in my sight. Hallelujah. He didn't earn that. That was given by God, and it was given through simple belief. So hear me, if you're watching tonight and you've never been saved, you'd like the feeling, you'd like not just the feeling, the reality of the guilt of your sin being taken from your life, you'd like God to be able to look down at you and say, you are made right, you are forgiven, you are righteous, I put my righteousness upon you. Do you know how difficult that is to do? Not very. All you have to do is take God at his word. To say, Lord, I believe. I believe your plan of salvation. I believe in Jesus Christ. So to Christians, Abraham is the father of our faith in the sense that we look to him and know that's how we are saved. By believing God, by taking him at his word. Because of what Jesus did. Okay. Jewish people in Judaism... Abram is also honored as a father of their faith. But they see Abraham as a great prophet of God. They look back at Abraham and say, hey, you know, the Jews were the ones to say God is one. There is only one God. Right? So the Jews look back to Abraham and they say he was a very good man of God who did what God wanted him to do and who moved from idolatry to believing in the one true God of the universe. Now, Muslims also look to Abraham. Someone who practices Islam would also say to you that Abraham was a great prophet of God. And they say Abraham is the father of the Arabs because of Ishmael. Okay, so the, all three religions give him credence, but to the Christians, he is altogether different because we know that he is a man just like us who God credited righteousness to by what? By faith. Is by faith we're saved, not by works, but by faith. Henry Morris, all right, said this, the judgment of the dispersion did not cause mankind to return to God. Most of the resulting nations continued in their rebellious ways, worshiping the host of heaven and descending into ever deeper moral degradation. Remember, Abraham's only a couple centuries from the Tower of Babel. There were a few here and there who retained some knowledge of the true God, but such were few and scattered. 
with the result that there was real danger that in a generation or so, knowledge of God would vanish from the earth. Okay, so you had the Tower of Babel, and God disperses people through the language barrier, and now all of a sudden everybody's scattering everywhere, and knowledge of God is just getting further from their mind, and what's going to happen, right? So here's what God chooses to do. Henry Morris says, knowledge of God is going to vanish, seems like it would vanish from the earth, or at least that is the way it might have seemed from the human point of view. God, however, cannot fail, and he will never leave himself without a witness. Read Acts 14, 17. Accordingly, at this point in history, 2,000 years or more since he had first created man, God undertook a completely new approach toward mankind. Okay, Abraham is a real pivotal thing here in history because God's going to take a different approach. And here's what he's going to do. He's going to begin to prepare a new nation, one which would be responsible for carrying God's revelation to other men and through whom the Redeemer could finally come into the world to work out God's plan of salvation. For this purpose, he chose a man named Abram. Think about it. In Genesis 3.15, God said to Adam and Eve, you know, when he cursed the serpent and he cursed Eve, he said, the progeny of Eve, he, he named one particular member, one particular person that would come from Eve. He said, he, Satan, will crush your head. Right? Right? Eve knew that a Messiah was coming. She didn't know when or how far down the road, but the promise was, someone's going to come from you, Eve. A descendant is going to come from you. And he is going to crush the head of the serpent. That's the Messiah. And ever since Adam and Eve, the people who truly believed in God were looking for that Messiah. You have the flood, you have the Tower of Babel, and everything seems to be going wrong. And people are becoming more and more scattered. God receding more and more from their minds. And so God says, you know what? I always have my plan of salvation. Kind of that red string that, that just goes through all of history. It's red because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I always have my plan, God says. And so just about it seems everything's gone crazy. God says, you know what? I'm going to narrow this thing down to a family. I'm going to call Abram from the line of Shem, from the line of Noah. I'm going to call Abram. And from him, I'm going to develop a nation. And that nation, the Jewish nation that came from Abraham, would be the people who gave to us the scriptures. And who brought to us, as we looked last week in the genealogies, you can trace the lineage of Jesus back to Abram, back to Adam. Amen? Okay, so God decides this is how I'm going to deal with mankind from now on. And I'm going to tell you something. As a Christian, we are friends of Israel as a Christian. We are friends of the Jewish people because the Jewish people brought to us the Bible and brought to us the Savior. Amen? And the Jewish people are still to inherit the land of Israel. I can't wait till we meet again when I show you the map of what geography God has actually promised to Israel that they will actually have during the millennial reign of Christ. J. Vernon McGee, after the Tower of Babel, God turns from the race of mankind to one individual, and from that individual, he's going to bring a nation. And to that nation, he will give his revelation. And out of that nation, he will bring the Redeemer. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I think I'm going to end it there because I know where this is headed next. And if I get there, we'll go way too long. So we'll end it at Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, and we'll pick it up next week. But what I want to remind you of is, I'm sorry, yeah, not next week. Technical department saying, no, 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 not next week. Remember that we meet the first three Tuesdays of every month. And so our next Genesis Bible study will be Tuesday, 
February 2nd. Tuesday, February 2nd. And I guarantee during that session, what we're going to do is talk about what geography was actually promised to Abraham and therefore what the Jewish people actually from the hand of God will get. There is such a, a, a radical um, animosity and fighting that goes on over there in the Middle East. And that's because all the powers of hell are trying to come against God's chosen people and what God has promised. And you're just going to see that that's all rooted in the truth of the Bible. But God has made a great promise to Israel. And therefore also has made a great and wonderful promise to those of us who are Christians, to those of us who are children of Abraham by adoption. Amen? We've been adopted into the family of faith. Before I pray, I want to remind you also, this Sunday, 10 a.m., same place right here, I'll be preaching from the Revelation live stream series, Feeble, Faithful, and Flying Soon to Victory. We're in Revelation chapter 3. Don't forget to go to hopeandpassion.org, get a hold of us, pray about giving. We exist because God supplies through you. Remember, Hope and Passion Ministries is not a traditional church. We are a parachurch ministry, so we depend on people who listen, who tune in online, and give. I pray that this has blessed you, and I want to pray over you right now. And ask you, Lord Jesus, in whatever way that you have moved by your Holy Spirit to touch each individual life, Lord, I just want to thank you. I want to pray your greatest blessing over each person that is listening. For some, that blessing would mean keep stirring them up, keep shaking them up, and keep making them uncomfortable until they call upon you as Savior and find forgiveness of their sins by the blood of Jesus and true salvation. And for others, Lord, that blessing means keep us on fire for you. Even in tumultuous times, even when other people are apathetic, Keep true Christians on fire for you. Lord, for those who are feeling downtrodden and weak and who know you as Savior, I pray that they would enter into a time in your word, in prayer, where their hearts would be lifted up. God, I, I keep feeling pressed to remind your church that you are in control. And that you told us in the book of Luke that when the whole world seems to be fainting with fear, when everything seems to be going crazy and chaotic, when all the signs of the end times seem just around the corner and beginning to be fulfilled, you didn't tell us to give up. You didn't tell us to be disheartened. You told us to lift up our heads and remember that our redemption draweth nigh. We thank you, Jesus, that you're coming again. Keep us strong. Keep us as your witnesses. In his precious name we pray. Amen. God bless you.